Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. On today's edition of Conversations, we're joined by uh, Stephen Kopitz uh, from uh, Princeton Energy Advisors. So we'd like to turn it over to him, let him uh, introduce himself before we uh, get into all the fun energy and market news. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, yes, as you, you stated, my name's Steve Kopitz, and I'm, I'm the, uh, uh, the founder and, and principal of uh, Princeton Energy Advisors, and we do uh, energy markets consulting mostly related to oil macro stuff which we'll be discussing today. My background is really out of management consulting and I ran the uh, New York office of Douglas Westwood uh, for, for a long time. Uh, Douglas Westwood did oil field uh, services market research. So we counted widgets for all kinds of things from okay. you know, drill ships and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> um, subsea manifolds to subsea acoustic modems and autonomous underwater vehicles. So I, I have expertise in the most arcane stuff that I'm not <laughs> sure I ever really wanted to know but there you go well it's always fun i mean you know, drill ships people might have to go into the google machine to figure out what a drill ship is nowadays yeah. based on uh, how that offshore has been going but you know you sent over some great slides and and you have uh, obviously some some broad insights that are uh, appreciated throughout the market and let's just kind of kick off, you know, you talk a little bit about the near term, medium term, long term, as we look at, mm -hmm. you know, where we are in the COVID cycle, and then what is this energy recovery going to look like? And kind of wh where does that sit in the cycle that you're looking at and your expectations going forward? Yeah, so I mean, my, my anticipation back from April, May was that there would be this oil price trap. If you read my stuff, then, then you know that I talk about that a lot, where we get back to a level, but really wouldn't get back much higher because of the mismatch between supply and demand right now, right? So, right. And, and that period really ended in the beginning of December. You could feel that we were moving out of that 37 to 43 WTI range that we'd been in for just about six months. And it's, there was a feeling that the market was beginning to, to consolidate. And that's actually continued and we see it now um, beginning to turn. So the rig additions are coming back on. And with the Saudi production cut of a million barrels a day, Suddenly, you can feel there's some some pressure in the market, um, and we're now beginning to head out with oil prices at you know it's close to 53 bucks last I checked. I mean that's really not very far from where we were in 2019 when the average was 57. So mm -hmm. so we're now edging back to a more normal environment, and I think people want to know you know is this going to be a transient thing where we fall back to 50, which is kind of the EIA view. Or does this then mean kind of a structural recovery? Right. And when you're looking at, you know, you mentioned the the rig counts, you know, frac spreads are obviously coming back as well. It, where are you thinking about or looking at the U.S. from that perspective? I mean, is it is it 11 million going to hold the line? Or are we going to start to see some growth by the end of the year? Or is this just where the U.S. is going to sit for the foreseeable future, given kind of that push pull that you've talked about with supply versus demand? Yeah. So if we look at the U.S., I mean, the U.S. is the pivotal player in all this, as I see it, right? We've become kind of the marginal producer in the, in the sort of pre-COVID era, right? So shale production was able to grow fast enough really to set marginal cost and price in the industry. Right. And now we've U.S. production has collapsed and we're down something like two million barrels a day. And it looks like that's affected productive capacity on that order of magnitude. Okay. Right? So go ahead. No, 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 please finish. Yeah, so the, the EIA is now saying, well, in terms of lower 48 oil production, so crude and condensate, we're going to be up about 700,000 barrels a day above current levels by year in 2022, mm. which in, in other words is not a lot. Right. If we add natural gas liquids, that's higher. So that's like close to 700,000 barrels a day a year. But still, it's not a huge amount if demand recovers quickly. Okay. And when you're looking at demand and, and you're talking about demand recovering quickly or potential for recovering quickly, I mean, what are you looking at or what are some of the metrics that you're gauging on the a U.S. level and global level to see how that balance is working? And if we do continue to see some of that upward momentum in oil price? Yeah, so I, I think there are two sort of functional narratives here, and I would put the EIA in one. You know, I'm a, I'm a very EIA-centric guy. I don't know, just it's easier mm -hmm. and I know the guys here. But, but – um, so the EIA is kind of has this straight line up, sort of gentle, all the way through 2022. If you look there and say, gosh, was there a vaccine introduced there? You can't see it. 
and it's just gradual, never really recovers to, to earlier levels. I don't think that, so they're using kind of a recession analogy, right? We had a recession mm-hmm. and there's a gradual. I'm still using an outage analogy. Like, you know, when you have a power outage in your house and, um, and you know, the power goes down and people come, you know, bring out the candles for a while and sit in the dark and tell stories, then the power comes back on and everything goes back to normal. And right okay. now, I still believe that that's closer to the truth than, than a recession type recovery here. So if this vaccine gets momentum, we could see a material demand recovery by starting in Q3, Q4. Okay. And then from Q3, Q4, is that something where we're going to get back on track to where we were in the last, let's call it 10 years, where we had about a million barrels a day of growth? Or do you think there's going to be some transition in terms of maybe a work from home or the, this green movement in terms of maybe coming off the uh, the flights and, and not seeing the same type of recovery? Or, or is it something a little bit different? Like we get back to this hundred and then we just kind of hang out at this level and, uh, and peter along as we kind of get our feet back underneath us. Yeah. So there are a couple of different narratives here. The one is that we've the, the, the EIA kind of takes an almost semi-permanent three or four million barrel loss there. I, I think that's too much. Um, okay. I think my sense of it, I mean, first we'll see what happens, but my sense of it is it will probably be behind the trend line by about a year. So that okay. puts us at about 105 million barrels of demand uh, by end of 2022. And the EIA's original forecast was 105 at the end of 2021. So slides us about a year, not a huge amount, okay. in, my, in my opinion. And when, when we look at what's happening within OPEC itself versus the U.S., yep. so we have, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia took the million barrels for March and uh, for February and March. You know, realistically, they can bring that back fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. But when you look at some of the other countries, you know, we've seen some peaks in some of the, some areas and some investments starting to kick back up in, you know, Iraq, uh, UAE. And then now Libya is kind of this unknown yeah. as to can they maintain this level? And, and obviously based on the ease of, you know, getting crude from the ground from that area, let alone their own geopolitical issues. But when you start looking at some of the investment that we're going to see over that time mm-hmm. period, if we really start to get back to this growth, I mean, where are some areas that you're seeing that could be of interest and that could maybe come on quickly or quicker than some of the other spots to try to make up and capture some of this uh, rally in crude pricing? Right. So f- first, I think OPEC is going to have a price led and not a volume led strategy. So mm-hmm. the difference between those two, a price led is if I can raise the price, I'd rather raise the price than produce more. Right. Mm-hmm. And a volume led. So so volume led is where, oh, if the price is good, I'll produce more. So Pioneer Natural Resources, for example, has a volume led strategy. Right. They're going to take a look at the futures curve or their belief about futures prices and then and then drill in complete wells based upon those beliefs or, or the futures curve. But they won't believe that they can set prices. So they're a price taker. By contrast, OPEC's going to say, well, you know, U.S. is kind of on the sideline for the next two years. Yeah, if we can drain these inventories, you know, keep things pretty tight and we can jack these prices up and recover some of those revenues that we lost in 2020. I believe that's what we're going to see. And that's how I interpret the Saudi cuts here. You know, the, it was a little unexpected that into the middle of a budding recovery, the Saudis say, hey, we'll cut another million barrels and poof, they put on five bucks onto the oil price. So right. my belief is that OPEC in general is going to feel like maybe higher prices are in their interest. I think they will return volumes, but they will not return volumes in a fully accommodative way. And they're going to try, I believe they're going to try to make the best use they can of this gap until U.S. shales sort of find their feet again. Because, you know, we have to put, if we assume we're going to kind of be back to normal by the end of 2022, 2023, U.S. shales have a lot of ground to make up. Right. So, um, so there's that. As for the risks, I think uh, Libya, as you mentioned, is always a risk. I mean, you can look at the numbers and, you know, you can use a dartboard to try to figure out what their production will be. <laughs> That's downside risk to my mind from current levels. Um, I think personally that I, I think there's going to be a push to bring Iran back into some sort of nuclear deal. And there's two million okay. barrels of capacity there. And I, I would say it's a coin toss whether that comes back into markets in the in the time horizon or not. Right. Yeah, I, uh, uh, Iran is an interesting one, especially when you consider that they have a, a pretty, you know, important 
election that comes towards the year end. And, and it's, an, it's, you know, do we try to do something ahead of that? Wait to see what the turnaround is because there's, you know, let's just for argument's sake, say that they're at about 2 million barrels a day right now, yeah. 1.9, depending on what they're putting into the market with another, maybe 2 million behind, yeah. behind that. And then obviously they have their storage, but that would get drained out pretty quickly. You know, that, that's, and it's interesting because when you look at, uh, you know, what something that uh, came out this morning from Iraq, that they're cutting some Basra flow into India. And now India is sitting there and they're going to have to go out and bid up Urals. And we've started to see some of that price recovery. But Iran fits perfectly into that, into that bucket when right. you look at how they're really positioned. So it's something when you look at how the U.S. is trying to position themselves within China, within, you know, Russia is trying to position themselves with India, it becomes a very strategic partnership. Mm -hmm. So there might be some leniency, if you will, of getting some of that crude back into the market, even ahead of a, uh, a bigger uh, agreement. But when, when you're looking at some of the demand cycles and some of the uh, potential headwinds, you know, the, Israel has come out and said that they're a bit concerned about some of the Pfizer uh, numbers or right. effectiveness of, of the, uh, of the vaccine. And now we have a new uh, kick up of, you know, let's just say cases, who knows how many in China, but, you know, right ahead, just ahead of Lunar New Year and Lunar New Year being the largest, you know, human migration of this, of the season. I mean, is it something that could maybe potentially delay some of this demand? Or do you think it, that this would just be kind of at that dip? And then we would just maybe instead of it being a year, it's just a quarter or half a quarter before we're really back. Because like, as you said, it's just more of an outage than a structural change. Yeah. I, I mean, I think if you're in the oil business right now, you're going to have to take a bet on the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. right? Do you have faith in the vaccines? Do you think there'll be mutations? Do you think it'll spread or will lose effectiveness? Or maybe what we've been told about the vaccines isn't quite true. Right. right. So so there's there's that whole thing. And right now, if you want to be in oil markets, you have to have expertise in, in epidemiology. <laughs> right. So. OK. So that's one thing. Um, my view that I'm holding right now is I expect the vaccine to be effective and I expect to roll out. So where I start differing with, say, with the EIA is really in Q3. So they're pretty mm -hmm. depressed. They've been reducing their demand forecasts almost every every month when they issue less now, but still reducing it. And so there's this continued pessimism, but um, the question is, well, wh where does that, where's the break trend? And for me, I think it's going to be sometime mid-summer to mid-fall when you start okay. seeing enough critical mass of vaccines that people say, oh, yeah, you know, I think Labor Day might be an important date where people go, oh, yeah, I'll go back to work now, right? right. And, and then we start going back and then you'll have some permanent loss of people who are telecommuting. But I got to tell you. I mean, working from home is great, but after a while, it's like you're just craving to go out and you know, like have <laughs> colleagues again. So I, I think that that's probably overrated. Um, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you know, China is still cranking along. India is still cranking along. I mean, the, you know, there are emerging economies that are still functioning underneath there and that haven't shut down. And, and that demand will show up at the back end as we go forward. So I'm probably on the optimistic side here. Okay. And the one, the, one of the interesting points that I just wanted to pull out a bit more is, you know, you talk about liquids and you talk about condensate and, and uh, NGLs on that side from the U.S. perspective as well. You know, we've seen even through the downturn that propane is and LPG in general is really seen as really come to shine. And, you know, in India right now, you know, mm -hmm. LPG is higher demand than gasoline. It, it, even if that switches back and gasoline comes, comes, you know, full circle, LPG still is there to stay, and and there's still that shortage. There's still some of that demand. I mean, is this some upside that we could see, where if some of these guys are price takers, all of a sudden you start to see some of those liquids, some of that condensate continue to move because China is still bringing on pet chem, and the demand is just continuing to rise on the naphtha and NGL side. Yeah, and I and I think that my sense is underlying it, we're still running a business as usual model. You know, where where the, the, the pre-COVID trends are there, they're suppressed right now. And mm -hmm. so the question is, well, how fa where do you bounce back to, right? Do you bounce back to the day of the start of the COVID pandemic? Or did you have some inherent growth going underneath there? And then you, you know, you pick up with the forecast at the, at the far end of the horizon. I'm not sure right. which one it is, but I think that demand will be pretty strong. I think okay. U.S. production capacity is significantly compromised. I think once we start looking around the globe, we'll see that about that much again. So something between two and four million barrels are reasonably compromised around the globe today. So if you project that out, you're going to be pretty tight in the markets 
from call it mid-year to Q3 this year and then hitting in the next year. And where it really gets tight is when you run off the excess inventories. And right. that in my model is about mid-year next year. So where you see a really tight market in our model is, is from uh, mid-year 22 to year-end 22 if we're projecting out at the two-year horizon. You know, then you're you're like you could be pretty tight in that in that window. Okay, and when you're looking at you know just this is going to lead back to you know some of those forecasts that you're talking about. You know, when you talk about a pioneer being a price taker, yeah. and now that you've seen front month, you know, essentially going till February 2022, you can effectively hedge above 50. Yes, and if you can hedge that to that level, or at least some sort of comfort in giving you a floor. Do you see that as pulling forward some some production as the front month has has moved in such extremes, and then then you're protected from a potential COVID issue or vaccines not being as effective because you're hedged out, you know, or or as they say, hedge, drill, complete, and just rinse and repeat as as long as you can. You know, is that something that you see, or is it, or do you think that the you know you, energy has really learned its lesson and it's going to take a bit more of a measured approach? as it comes back to market. Okay, okay, let's start with the second question first. Has energy learned its lesson? No. So <laughs> let's go back. The reason is that that first, these guys love to drill. It's what they live right. for, right? And the second is, if they have money to drill, right? If you have a curve that, okay, there's a curve, great, let's go and drill it, you know, hedge it out, or if you like, spec, do it on spec, and uh, and let's drill, right? We, could, we can do that. But if you have enough people drilling against the curve, you'll collapse the curve over time, right? And that seems to be what, what happens. Um, okay. So no, I there is no self discipline in a market. There are only prices and incentives, <laughs> and these guys always jump on them. So no, I, I don't think the future will be different than today, uh, despite uh, promises to that uh, effect. What I do think is begun to happen and will continue to happen is that these prices, rigs are going to come back online, spreads are going to come back online, and they're going to come back in quantity. So right. you know, right now, I mean, one of the things that's not much talked about is that we're still you know, before before the pandemic, we were at about 600 horizontal rigs plus or minus, and that was looking a little bit light because uh, production peaked in November of 18, as you'll recall. So U.S. shale production was already rolling off before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, so you probably need 600 rigs to get it back into that level, right? And that implies something around 400 uh, spreads. And we're right, right. now to something 158 spreads, right? And 250 rigs. So you still have a lot of rigs and spreads to add. And I think those are gonna come back big time through the course of the year. Um, okay. You know, and then that's gonna translate into production. How soon, but keep in mind, we're still underwater, right? So it's not mm -hmm. like we're at 480 rigs or 500 rigs and oh, if we add another 100 rigs, then we're in plus, we're still way underwater. So that you gotta add a lot of rigs to get us back into sort of a break even level. So, you know, I, I more or less take the EIA's view on this, that we're going to have relatively modest increases from, from lower 48 oil production uh, through the horizon. And I think that, and I think that OPEC is going to jump on it. Okay. And when you, some of the uh, commentary out there on the bullish side is that we're going to see $150, $200 prices by the time we get into 23, 24, 25, just from the underinvestment that we've seen from, let's call it from 2015 onwards. And this is just, you know, essentially building up to this compression and that we're going to get this big explosion to the upside. I mean, you, as you talked about with price taker, price setter, and trying to squeeze some of those volumes, there just seems to be a decent amount of investment that's, that's coming back now or starting to come back. And there's, you know, when you're looking at some of the potential out there, for investment, I mean, where do you think some of this growth can come into, or do you really, or do you think that there is some potential to see some of this surprise to the upside, or do we kind of cap out at an eighty-five, you know, eighty eighty-five through twenty-two into twenty-three, just yeah. given some of the dynamics we're seeing in the market? Yeah, I mean, I think we can see pretty material price pressure as we head towards the end of twenty-two. And the question that arises there, well, how fast can U.S. shales respond? You know, and we've okay. seen historically they're pretty fast. You know, so so one question is how fast and how far? Because if you look um, after the first peak, right, um, back in 15, 15, 14, 15, mm -hmm. and then we had the price crash 
And it took the basins other than the Permian five years to recover that their previous high. So how long does it take the Permian to recover its previous high? You know, is that one year, two year, five years? If it's five years, then then you're going to see some real impressive oil prices. Right. Maybe it's shorter. I, no, please finish. I, I think from my perspective, the question is, are you on, on the gas or on the brake? Right? right. Are you do you have your money on the table? Are you taking it off the table? Right now, the money's on the table from my perspective. And whether you're going to make good returns or spectacular returns, I expect to see a really two good years in the oil patch in front of us. Let's okay. see where we are, you know, as we go down the line. Yeah. One of the things that we've, we've talked about in, on our uh, year end report and we've been looking at is just how long this equipment has been sitting in, in the yard yeah. and you know, how much of it has been maintained, how much of it has kind of been left to, to rot away and then become mm-hmm. spare parts on the other side. So one of the things that we're looking at is if we do get some some big response, will we even have the equipment available to meet that response? And and the longer you sit out there, you know, you're talking about you and and it's insane what they have to do. I mean, you're talking about rotating tires, mm-hmm. uh, changing oil, turning things on for you know, at least once a week, you know, wrapping things to make sure that the elements don't destroy it. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a lot of and it's expensive. I mean, we're not talking about an easy or cheap thing to maintain. And then the question is, can we have that response? And then obviously that's the equipment side. Will the labor come back? I mean, will, can you go out and hire enough people? Yeah. And if, if you are hiring them, what price can you have, do you have to woo them back from? Because how many, as you've said, how many booms and busts can you go through before you're like, you know, this is, this is too much. I'm, I'm out. I, I'm going to do something else. And, and there's, there's this interesting push and pull as to what, what can the U.S. response really look like? You know, in near term, you know, there's running room, but then as you start to extend past 250 or so spreads, mm-hmm. it becomes questionable. And, and that's going to, I think you're going to start to see some panic if you go to call a spread and it's just not available. Yeah. So that and, says invest in services because they should have good margins, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd like to hope, right? <laughs> no, I, mean, nice I, I think that's where it's going to be. I, I think it's, and I've said this, I think oil fields, my last note was entitled Let the Party Begin. I had a lot of people sign up on that note because like, oh, okay, there you go. Greed over fear. And and um, so I, I, I think that's right. I think the, the, the down market will be displaced by an up market. Mm-hmm. If, if, the, 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 if the power outage analogy is correct, right? Okay. Then this thing, demand is going to come back way faster than supply. And it's going to be a very tight market for a while. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that makes me bullish, at least until, you know, services and the shale operators can catch up with the market. And that could be, you know, at least through 2022, I would think. Um, Right. Again, the downside risk and and a really important caveat here is is what you believe about the the Biden administration and and Iran, because my reading of the numbers is that the EIA is light at the horizon so that the 2022 ish in there by two to 3 million barrels a day on demand. So that's mm-hmm. a lot, right? But yeah. that's just about as much as the Iranians have sitting on the shelf. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, that's the, that's the caveat. Right. You know, we, we made a very, um, a, a, a comment or a view that in, in really July of 19, that, you know, we see, we saw the peak that we, that we, saw the peak, we started to see that uh, some of that come down. And it was more because we were overshooting the demand for light, sweet crude. And, mm-hmm. and if you look, you know, that 13.2 just wasn't the, you know, quote unquote, right number. You know, there mm-hmm. is there's now a, a crude quality problem because all of that excess had to be exported. We just didn't mm-hmm. have the, the facilities to really operate with that kind of light sweet. And as you start to see this pivot, and when you look at China bringing on such new capacity, a lot of that has coking capacity. A lot of that is relatively complex. So even if the U.S. starts to respond, there, you know, what are you thinking about some of the spreads and some of the differences where, you know, OPEC might be in might be incentivized to come back a little bit sooner because even though the you know the the typical uh, spreads are you know still are a little bit weak, we're seeing some some tightness in in heavy sour. We're starting to see some of this movement where their crude grades are starting to come in at a at a bit of a premium, and they might try to pull forward some. You know, where are you looking in terms of specific crudes and some kind of quality that might uh, incentivize some activity ahead of schedule? 
Well, I, I think it's as you phrased it, Mark. I, I think first that OPEC, you know, has an incentive to be tight with supply mm -hmm. because the, they can see the U.S. shales are going to take a little while to collect themselves. Now, as U.S. shales come back, right, what's increasing most in supply is going to be the light sweet stuff, right? So right. That, that normally will open up the spread between Brent and WTI, but I'm not the world's best ex expert on that topic. <laughs> Now, when when we're looking at some of the uh, the shifts, you know, we 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 were sitting in uh, in technically a peak season. We still have a lot of uh, refiners down, just trying to work off some of the product, and we still have some of that product builds. W how are you looking at some of the product that's sitting out there that has to kind of come that has to come yeah. off before you get some of this incentive at, to 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 bring back some of this capacity and and to really be you know the, they're the biggest demand drivers. So when we were looking right. at that, how are you kind of marrying where you think things were going and and where the product right. glut can really start to get worked down? Yeah. So so distillate is actually up on last year, right now on a four week moving average basis. Distillate supplied is actually up. And that's not too surprising because, you know, everybody's ordering stuff from Amazon. Um, okay. and, and that'll actually become more acute as these rigs start to come back online because there's usually mm -hmm. diesel, diesel consumption associated with that. So uh, distillate is effectively back to normal. I think it will continue to look good. Um, right. Gasoline was down now about 14% with this latest round of the pandemic. It's come back to now about 10% down from normal. Gasoline will be the big mover with the vaccine. Right. So mm -hmm. that's that's where our reserves of demand really are sitting is in the gas gasoline pool, because people say, OK, now I can go to the movies, go to the restaurant, right. do my job. And and that, I think, would close up pretty close to, to normal if a vaccine becomes widely available and people believe that they can freely move around. The last component is uh, jet fuel, kerosene aviation mm -hmm. fuel. And that's now still 30 percent below normal in, in the U.S. But it's not a huge amount in terms of our demand. And that will probably close up, I would guess, if things get better to say between 10 and 15% normal. So mm -hmm. that leaves you light maybe half a million barrels a day on that order of magnitude. So, okay. you know, that's, you're down yeah, two, 3%, maybe just a little bit. And, and I think that will tend to come back because I think the aircraft will fly before the load factors catch up. So in other words, it, they're going to say, oh, OK, so people are coming back. So I'll add another flight. Doesn't mean it's full. Right. But it is right. burning fuel coming back and forth. So I think we'll be a little light there. But, you know, I think the big the big play here is gasoline. And that is what I believe the 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 um, the vaccine is really going to affect. Mostly that's where the big bang for the buck is. OK. And, you know, in, in the report that you had put out, you, you talked to some of the risks that you were looking at on the big picture yeah. was a financial crash or yeah. some sort of correction on the economy side. What what type of metrics are you looking at to say, OK, you know, we need to start to pair this back a bit because there's some stress in the market. You know, as we as we see some of the economic data coming out, some of it's bullish, some of it's bearish, you know, depending on yeah. uh the time frame and where it is. I mean, what what are you what do you think is the most important on the financial side or economic data side to say, you know what, this this might be a little bit sooner or this might be a little bit later because of some of the things that we're noticing? Yeah. So so right now the Fed uh, and the Treasury through stimulus are maintaining a really easy money and big stimulus policy, right? Mm -hmm. And you can see distortions occurring across the market because of it. I mean, housing prices here <laughs> in Wellfleet, uh, you, you know, are, are up, I don't know, 13% in a year, okay? In an economy that is being crushed. Okay, so, uh, okay, right. that's easy money. Um, you can see it in the trade deficit. The trade deficit is surreal right now. Mm -hmm. It's worse than it was in 08, which caused that huge correction. You know, it's, it's really out of whack. And that's because there's so much money in from stimulus that's going into imports. And the, the, one of the markers I really use are certain types of unconventional vehicles on the stock market. One of these is SPACs, Special Purpose Acquisition Companies. These are used to be called blank check companies, and they're quite expensive. So it, if a hedge fund wanted to buy a trucking company, right, and would pay 100 to get that onto the stock market via SPAC, you'd have to value it at 130 because the transaction costs are so high. So you only get SPACs when you get a large disconnect between private valuations and public valuations. And that almost always says you have a stock market bubble. And those almost always end in a stock market crash. 
right? So, so that's in there. Now, the Fed, the Treasury, I mean, they're just going to launch another big stimulus this coming week, right? Yep. And, and the Fed is going to sit on its hands because they're not going to say, oh, we're going to raise interest rates. Sure, we're all still, you know, this, is, this party is going to go on until the vaccine starts rolling out. And then you have a guy, you know, who had the flu and every day you were giving him amphetamines, right? Oh, this will make you feel better. And then he's going to recover. You're still going to be giving him amphetamines. And, you know, there's probably going to be a crash there. Now, the, right. the question is, what's the nature of that crash? I think it looks more like 87 than 2007. And the reason right. for that is that the housing market is very tight right now in mm -hmm. the U.S. And, and the housing cycle and the business cycle aren't that separable. So it's very difficult to keep things down if you're short on housing, right? Because right. if you press down those houses, well, we, we're still short, so the prices will tend to pop back up. And that's very different than what we saw in 2007, where we had this huge overhang of housing. Right now, we're still very tight. So that speaks to more like an 87, where we have a correction, some sort of bad feeling for a few months, and then people collect themselves and move forward. But do I expect a correction here? Yeah, on paper, it looks like it. Right. You know, one of the uh, in our economy show, we, we, we had this great chart on SPACs looking at, you know, going back to 2010 and, and just looking at how many came online. And, and I, I think the number was from 2019, we had about 26 billion. And then in, uh, in 2020, I think it was 87 billion. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that's <laughs> that's that's some easy money right there, right there uh, coming coming to market. And it's just it's interesting, like as, as everyone tries to lock in some of these uh, some of these gains. And, and when you talk about. You know, the, obviously the Biden administration coming in, some of the the, the shifts when we're, we're going to get that second stimulus. You know, the Fed has been very adamant that they're going to be at that 120 billion or so for the foreseeable future, keeping those metrics or the borrowing, you know, or financial conditions very light and easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there is there something where on on the back end that jobs like where where do jobs kind of sit in? where we've seen a big drop off in jobs, people continue to struggle to, to yeah. find work. I mean, how much of that is gonna weigh in on some of the gasoline demand and some of the other demand factors as people just don't have the capital and or the, the means to move about as much? Yeah, but the presumption is that if, you, if you're using an outage thing, those jobs come back really quick, okay. really quick. And it's worse than that, right? Because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who are near retirement age, who took the pandemic as a, as a, an excuse, a cause, a motivation to, in effect, take early retirement, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I actually spent some of this in the pandemic in Hawaii testing, you know, the safety of flying. It was safe. And right. uh, so I, 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 the, the stores were all closed. So I was, I was in, in Kona on the big island, and, and I, I went and talked to some of the guys, and they said, well, you know, these stores are all empty. And they said, yeah, because the, the, the owners have not only shuttered them, they've left the business. And, right. and so you're going to see that we're missing – some folks on the back end of it. And the second thing is demographically heading into 2025, we have a very, very tight labor market, very tight labor mm -hmm. market. So, you know, my presumption is if things turn back on, they turn back on pretty fast and pretty completely. And the gasoline mm -hmm. demand is linked to jobs. So those, those two are all but synonymous. Okay. And, and when you're, and when you're looking at that and taking that to the next level, as I, I you know, one of the things that we talked about in the econ show and as, as out as you haul coming out with there, where people are moving, yeah. what states have seen some of the, and you, you've seen clear indications of that urban to suburban move. Yeah. You know, we've seen it in the car data. We've seen it in some of the, obviously, as you talked about the housing data, is there a second wave or did we see it and now it's people getting comfortable and just going about their normal business? Or is there going to be that blend of, you know, I, I, I'm used to buying stuff online. I'm going to continue to yeah. do that. And, and, you know, that blended schedule mutes a bit, I mean, not to say that, that we stay down here, but it, instead of seeing that growth, we kind of flatten out and just get back to where we were prior to, uh, to COVID. Well, if you take, so, I mean, the answer is, I don't know. If you're asking mm -hmm. my, my sense of it, mm -hmm. my sense of it is that things will become surprisingly normal, surprisingly fast. And we will be back in that range where we have you know, a pretty stable gasoline consumption in the country. It's not really moving up or down that much. It's going to be pretty stable. Mm -hmm. Diesel demand could continue to do well because, I, yes, I do think people are becoming accustomed to ordering a lot more online. And I, I think those habits will persist. But also, you know, oil drilling and, 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 and production is, is distillate heavy, heavy. It uses a lot of distillate and you can see those yeah. in the statistics. And that's, 
So we may be above normal for distillate demand, about average, or maybe a little light on gasoline. Okay. Now, you know, you talk about a lot of the EIA data and they, they do a great job of looking at, you know, ducks and, and some of the production and, and where the permits are more specifically getting into a bit more about the administration. We know about the stimulus that's coming. They're mm-hmm. going to maintain that easy money move. But when we look at fracking and we look at activity and we come to federal land versus public land, uh, you know, versus private land and, there, there's some permits, there's some running room, but at what point do, do we start to get concerned about some of this activity that, that is going to be hindered in New Mexico? Because New Mexico is kind of that where we could right. see some impact, especially in the Delaware. I mean, can you talk a bit more about what you're seeing, what you're thinking, especially as we get into and stay, we start to work through some of those permits, not in really 21 and getting into 22? Yeah, I mean, my advice to the Biden administration would be to ride the shales and say, you know, those are hardworking Americans and they're adding value and those are real good paying jobs, which they actually are real good paying jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would just write it up for a couple of different reasons. The first is that it is going to come back materially. And yeah, we may be constrained in places, but but it's it's going to come back and it's going to be pretty robust whether or not the Biden administration endorses it or not. So from my point of view, I think it would make sense and say, look, Shale production, very important to the economy, sure, renewables, uh, clean energy, all that. But people still have to drive their cars today, right? Mm -hmm. People still have to fly today. They still have to heat their homes today. So we need to think about it more as a balanced portfolio moving forward where we balance, you know, some renewables, some clean stuff and just daily, you know, getting stuff done. Um, I would do that. The second thing that's important is this $150 oil thing, right? So the question is, how long do shales run? And if you go back several years ago, typically like a Goldman Sachs analysis, you would see U.S. shale production kind of peaking out 2023, 2025 in that range, right? right? When U.S. shale production peaks out, oil prices are going up because Mm -hmm. shales are the only discipline on global oil prices, right? That's why oil fell from 100 to 60 to whatever, 45, is because U.S. shales were able to overproduce. Right. And they crash the oil prices now three times, I guess, two and a half times. Okay. And um, and so when U.S. shales lose that discipline on the market, when they're not able to put that million barrels per day per year into play. So so not enough to cover incremental global demand. Right. Mm-hmm. Prices are going to move back up and they could move back up in a big way if it turns out that we are, we've really kind of already come over the the Permian peak, right? And it's really not that resilient. The risk is right now for the Biden administration, they've got to run in 2024, right? Mm -hmm. And they're running, okay. So you might be running into very high oil prices in 2024, and then you can be blamed for, okay, you know, well, if if they'd only stood behind shales, the optics are bad, regardless of the substance. Um, yep. The other interesting thing is because we're just about a net exporter, we're sort of you know balanced net importer exporter right now. Um, it's become very regional. So if there's an oil shock, nobody in Texas is going to say, "Dang, that's terrible. We're making hundred dollar oil." You know, geez, you know, I got to get a new Ferrari to make me feel better. In the mid continent, nobody's going to say, "Gosh, life is so bad." They're going to say, "Gosh, life is great." But if mm-hmm. you look where we consume oil on the two coasts. New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, California, you know, where gasoline prices are high and those are all democratic states. They're going to be sucking it up. Right. So, so there is, um, there is reason for the Biden administration to soft pedal antagonism to oil and gas. Right. Mm -hmm. If I were them, I'd say, yeah, you know, it's it's kind of terrible, but you know, you know, we don't want to blow up the economy. Right. Um, so uh, there's that. And the second thing is I would be looking very strongly at getting those Iranians back on back into the agreement. One, Iran has stated that it wants to be back in an agreement. And I think that the Biden administration wants that, too. But there's also, you know, in your back of your mind going, yeah, we want things to recover. But, you know, if we've guessed wrong and these markets are really tight, then 2024 is going to be a nightmare for the Democrats. So right. getting that extra two million barrels back in play in some form. For me, if I were in the Biden administration, that would be a sort of fail safe. Yeah. And and it's interesting because when you think about, you know, cheap money, easy money, 
then you start looking at you know some of the ways that inflation has been tempered down. You can look at diesel, you can look at gasoline, and if you all of a sudden start to see that those barrels creeping up exponentially, I mean that that inflation isn't going to creep; that's going to explode, and then that's going to make things a little bit more difficult, especially in 2024 when you start looking at that, you know, back and forth. Uh, and, and the comps get harder. I mean, let's be fair. I mean, we've had low oil prices and low gasoline prices and diesel for an extended period of time, and those year-over-year -year numbers catch up quickly, and that CPI can jump. But when when you're looking at it, and just to kind of round out, because you mentioned you know green energy, and we've seen some very lofty views yes. of the adoption of EVs and some other green technology. I mean, how are you factoring in some of the potential erosion to demand? To demand, or do you think that it's really a, a non-starter till after 2030? And it's, or is it something that could be accelerated if we do get oil prices uh, shifting higher and making some of these things a bit more attractive? So I'm largely discounting electric vehicles having an impact on oil demand to the medium term horizon. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think they're out there in feature. I, I don't think it's going to change the narrative fundamentally. Right. Um, you know, maybe they'll become more competitive than there are, than they are today. Mm -hmm. Right now, I don't see that as the major risk. I see the risk as the other side that once the Permian is no longer able to expand by you know, upwards of a million barrels per day per year, oil prices are going back up. And at that right. point, you're saying, well, what are my alternatives? Right. And and in the bigger picture, right, shales are not a success story for the oil system. They're 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 a cautionary tale. They're, you know, because what happened is that conventional production where you drill the vertical well and you suck stuff out, that went away. That's gone. Right, we can't supply incremental barrels out of that world anymore. So what we said is, oh, look at this garbage lying around. Maybe we can frack it horizontally and get something out of it. And we could. And and that's good as long as it lasts. But when that mm -hmm. loses its edge, you know, we're back to to 2011, 12, 13 in fairly short order. So if I look at electric cars, I'm considering it more and self driving, by the way, because I think that pairs with electric cars. But but I think. Um, if I'm looking at electric cars, I'm looking at it as, as more of a hedge than as a substitute, you know, where okay. if I'm the Biden administration, I don't want to get in a position where, oh, Jesus, now we're tight again and we mm -hmm. just look like a bunch of idiots. <laughs> and in you know, rounding out the, the comments on on green, you know, we have Halliburton talking about that, you know, connecting the frack to the grid. I mean, do you think that that's something that makes sense on an on an efrac side, or is it is it something where it, it's going to be a little tough to make it something that's going to catch on just because some of these areas are so far away from electrical connections? Is there something that they could do to try to show that they're becoming greener, if you will, or or start to meet some different standards, or or just is it something where it is what it is? They'll use they'll try to use natural gas coming out of the well try to show the, how that's that's a big benefit, and then we'll kind of go from uh, from that perspective. So you're, you're talking about what the oil people consider, consider risible, risible virtue signaling. Exactly. Right? <laughs> you know, where did I read, uh, so Google or something, uh, carbon neutral since 2007. No, you, you're a huge user of energy. If you want to be carbon neutral, shut down Google. That's carbon neutral. Right. And, and um, so I think that virtue signaling is there. I mean, if you're near a grid, sure, but are you really going to string 300 miles of, of, of wire to get it to yeah. your spreads? I don't think so. No. Um, so I think I think uh, I think that let me as a side say that that the very worst offenders of this are the oil majors, and within the right. oil majors, let me let me single out BP. Mm -hmm. So an integrated energy company, no, that's called a conglomerate. That went out of style in the 1960s. OK, mm -hmm. imagine that you had to figure out BP's underlying economics, not only by oil and gas prices, but also by the price of electricity in Jakarta. Right. Right. I mean, no, that's not going to work in that form. And and the problem is that I feel that the oil majors are becoming complicit in misleading the public about what's actually possible. Right. And, and saying, oh, yeah, sure. A absolutely. Yeah. B B can become a, you know, wind manufacturers. I don't know what the hell, but, but that's not true. 
Okay, right. they're going to make their money in oil and gas 10 years from now, just like they're doing it today. And mm -hmm. if you can't do that successfully, you need to sell the company. It's that simple. Right. And you know, rounding out now, just because we're we're getting towards the end, when we start looking at natural gas and LNG in general, in terms of some of the, you know, not so much a bridge fuel, but a part of the solution yeah. going forward. It, when you're looking at natural gas consumption, it, do you think of that as taking some market share from not only just coal, but from diesel and other distillates? Yeah. Or is it something where it's it's still a little bit further out there? We're still going to get some of this oil growth before we start to get some real um, market share taken away by gas. Because there is a lot of stranded gas out there yeah. that would love to find a home. It's just a matter of, does is there a home? And, and how do we make it effective, especially under some of these um, movements towards the fact that, you know, gas is bad and we can't even, uh, even have this conversation about a short cycle gas turbine. Yeah. So um, I think if you take a look at the high oil price period, 2005 to 2014, the place where, where oil was really squeezed out of was not transportation where it's still a monopoly fuel, but other uses, one of the biggies was heating oil. Right, so a lot of people switched to natural gas or propane. And my personal feeling is that this is again for the Biden administration an opportunity mm -hmm. because we're kind of go, okay, we're gonna subsidize solar, fine. How about subsidizing propane? You know, the, the fixed assets part of it. Um, propane is 25%, 24% cleaner in terms of CO2 than oil for heat and, and utilities. Um, and it's gonna be cheaper, particularly if oil goes back up. So. Right. It's a, it would be a really easy to say, oh, there are the solar programs and, you know, the, the, the wind programs. And oh, we have a propane program, which if nothing else has signaling because the people who use propane are going to be rural. Those mm -hmm. are because the people don't use natural gas today because like us here in Cape Cod and in the outer Cape, we don't have gas lines. You know, it's too right. rural for that. So we all heat with oil here. But, but if you take a look at the people who are putting up houses new here, those are all propane. And. Okay. And the, the, if you want virtue signaling, right, little virtue signaling would say, hey, rural people who voted for Donald Trump, but we'd like to vote for Joe Biden or Kamala Harris in 2024. Hey, let's recognize that you also have needs and maybe propane is something that can ease your life a little bit and let's give you tax credits or whatever. So I think that, that there is opportunities for natural gas and for propane, particularly if you believe that we might be tight on the oil supply again as we head to the middle of this decade. And I think, you know, right now that's my expected case scenario. I might be wrong. Okay. That's my... And last question before we, we sign off, Keystone Pipeline. Is yeah. this something that is just a non-entity because nobody really believed it? Or is this going to be a meaningful impact to Canadian crude into the U.S. and, and unlocking some of the, that Canadian crude in the, uh, in the north? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, if I'm a Canadian, my only read is that the Americans are colossal jerks. But, <laughs> you know... They could go back to the War of 1812 and draw that same conclusion. So, so right. let's, let's start with that. Um, you know, right now, so Keystone's been very controversial. It's going to continue to be controversial. It's going to struggle because it has symbolic value to the left. You know, it's a big, bad, awful pipeline and from Canada and crude and oil, oil sand stuff. I think it's going to be a very tough sell. Keystone will come back on the agenda when oil prices are above 80. Okay. And people say, oh, my God, we have to do something. And until then, I think it's off the table. I know that's not good for the Canadians and God bless them, because if it were up to me, I'd build a pipeline. But mm -hmm. right now, that's the politics. And I, I think that for the moment, it's dead and it's going to be dead until either Republican is elected again. Let's, I don't even know if that's any possible anymore. Maybe we'll just have a coup right. or, <laughs> or oil prices go up enough to scare Democrats. And so I think, you know, I mean, for the moment, that's I think it's going to be pretty dead. Okay. Now, before we sign off, any, any last comments uh, that you'd like to make or talk about? No, I mean, I, I think we're entering a, a real exciting time. You know, it's been a, a seven years of fat, seven years of lean. We are coming through August of 2021 is the end of seven years of lean, right? So we haven't done better than the biblical Joseph in the business cycle timing. And, and I think that is likely that we are now coming to the end of the, of the, of the shale period by which okay. I mean where shale was the setter of marginal prices. Mm -hmm. You know, where shale by itself, virtually U.S. shale producers by themselves were able to carry 
incremental global demand for a long time. And I suspect we are now coming up towards the end of that period. Whether we've already passed it, possible, whether we pass it 2024, 2025, 26, something like that. But we are now, I think, past the midpoint. Mm -hmm. And and so it's now it should be more fun to be in oil again. Possible to make <laughs> some money. I think the next few years look really good, whether or not shales come back. Um, but I think we can now start looking at oil as a, a little less marginalized and loathed and kind of shunted to the side uh, than it's been in the last last several years. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you for the time, Stephen. It was an absolute pleasure. So yeah, you can fun. find his work at uh, at the at Princeton um, at the uh, Princeton, Energy Advisor. Princeton Energy Advisors. I knew I was going to get it right. Uh, you can find his. Uh, his, his we'll put links in the show, and sure. then you can obviously uh, reach out and learn more uh, of the uh, great insights and commentaries that come from Stephen and his team. So thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. Mm -hmm.